Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to My Left Ear. It's Friday, August 20th. And uh, this video is video number 53. And I've entitled it Empathy and Suffering in honor of this past week. My name is Carrie Freeman. And My Left Ear is a left leaning site. We do, uh, I do political and psychic commentary and I branch off and I do a little bit of healing material also because that's my background. So I call myself a change agent. I do a lot of different things to help people, but I have been doing uh, psychic coaching, which is explained in my video. Psychic coaching is video number 34. You should take a look at it. And I am also a clinical hypnotherapist. Sometimes I combine the two. If you want any information, email me. The email's right there below. And as I like to say, as my uh, subscribers know, I have various ways of manifesting. And one of them is to say, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? So wouldn't it be nice if Carrie gets 5,000 followers by October 3rd? Putting it out there, friends. So here we begin and I take a deep breath. And I want to admit to you that I feel very solemn uh, today. I, I just feel the gravity of the world right now, as many of you do also. I wanna do something a little different. I wanna talk about my empathic experience uh, over 30 years ago, maybe 32, 33 years ago, there was a giant news story. It came out of the Midwest, if I remember correctly. A little baby, a little girl named Jessica, they called her baby Jessica, a toddler, fell into a pipe and stayed there for three days until they could figure out how to get her out and rescue her, which they did. But it was three days of nonstop coverage. And before I really understood this part of me, that time travels and doesn't have boundaries and feels, um, I could not sleep. I could not sleep. I would go to bed and I'd lie awake and I think, She's inside of a pipe. She's in a pipe. And I couldn't sleep. And then I finally slept when they rescued her. Well, there's a little bit of that going on with me right now in regard to Afghanistan and the suffering. I'm going there and I'm feeling it and it's kind of overwhelming. So if I'm not as funny today, uh, that's the reason. So Joe Biden is speaking at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Could be interesting. My left ear wants him to show more empathy for the suffering. I saw a veteran, but uh, this man, I didn't write his name down, but he's got a podcast and he has all these medals and experience in combat. And he said on the Stephanie Rule show this morning, that he'd been watching a different President Biden this past week. And I have to admit, and you, I believe you know that I really like him, and I'm really happy he's our president, but I can think objectively also. Uh, part of uh, my pain is um, watching this watching a, like a little bit of a fall from grace, which I don't think will sustain, but he's really fighting the press right now, Joe Biden. Anyway, I think he has been defensive. I watched his interview with um, Joyce Stepanopoulos, and it's a, it is a different kind of Joe Biden. And from my experience working one-on-one, -on -one, uh, doing therapy, counseling people, observing behavior, and my left ear, deep down inside, and I always could be wrong, see, because as Stephanie Rule and all these people with TV shows, basically everybody's saying, we still don't know enough. 
we don't know everything yet and we don't. So I'm going on right now that it looks like um, missteps in planning. We might find out something different later, but I, I believe Joe Biden knows that it could have been handled differently. But in his presidential position, it can't really come out and be uh, completely frank. I don't think anyway. Now you, you people always let me know if you disagree with me. I'm sure you, I'm sure you will. Um, and that's the reason for the defensiveness. But my hope is that he comes out a little bit softer today because he's saying, I know we knew there was going to be chaos, but it's this tough, uh, kind of crusty guy that I was having a hard time recognizing. I don't know. I don't know about you. Um, the United States is in um, currently trying to do an autocorrect is what I'm calling it, an autocorrect. Um, it reminds me, you know, because I've, I've told you I've, I worked in uh, alcohol, drug and alcohol rehab for eight years and saw hair raising uh, stories, people, relapses, behaviors, and some success stories too. I do want you to know that. Um, and once again, not knowing all the history, but I know it goes back to Bush and all kinds of things. We've been enabling um, Afghanistan, hoping that they would absorb the training that we offered. Once again, I don't know how good that training was, but I know we offered it and that they collapsed so quickly. Um, so this really was a bit of an enabling situation. And it reminds me of uh, drugs and alcohol. I ran it by a very, very smart client that I have yesterday. And she said, you're right. I never thought of it like that. Um, so autocorrect. And the U.S. is pivoting and rescuing as many Afghanis, interpreters, and U.S. citizens as possible. The tragic part is that they won't get to everybody. And the part of me that doesn't sleep is relating to women and girls that are getting, that have been getting educated and we're gonna do great things on the planet. And I just kind of keep heaving big sighs about that. Now I ran the runes this morning and I just asked flat out, will Biden's presidency survive his decisions this past week? And I actually got a yes, they will survive. It's early on in his presidency, and there's still some extremely positive things going on in his presidency. But I got movement, which is progress. It's improving and bettering. I got protection reversed. But that message is take responsibility for your position it's a neutral, just take responsibility. And the final rune is gateway. And the message is reclaim your power. So, however you feel, it appears that Joe Biden will bounce back from this. Now, a plus, a few pluses here. By, now I'm reading a little bit. Biden's economy is doing well, really well. Uh, now, I repeat something that I looked up, so I'm repeating something. Consumers shook off the pandemic blues as 2021 began, putting stimulus checks to work, buying cars and other goods, and helping set the stage for what could be the fastest economic growth in de decades. Jobs are up. Now, you probably know that presidential elections are won and lost on the economy. So this is extremely good for Joe Biden. And then if it maintains, uh, which I think it will. Vaccines are up. Pe more people are now finally getting the message and they're getting vaccinated. Not sure why they might be aware of deaths. They might be aware of all the children that are at risk, that are back in quarantine. So 
Many of the largest increases in the pace of daily shots are in states with low, low vaccination rates and worsening outbreaks. So somehow a message is getting through. I don't think it'll be 100%. Uh, will Trump run in 2024? Everybody on TV has an opinion about this. I'm going to maintain, my left ear is going to maintain, no. Uh, if you've noticed, he's deteriorating more and more. And when he speaks, it's kind of like a repetitious word salad. Um, my left ear. Uh, this has been going on with me for about a week, and I haven't mentioned it, but then I've been hearing other people mention it too. So I'm like, okay, I was plugging into something. We were plugging into something. So now I'm going to mention it. My left ear sees some kind of a march on Washington regarding Merrick Garland, that people are just going to need to get out of their houses and complain. And it's due to the, the unrest is due to the silence of the DOJ. It's utter crickets. And we don't know whether Garland is hiding. Now, I did do the I did do uh, the runes, and it said eventually he was going to surface with indictments. But it but the rune was harvest, which is one year. I think there will be um, a march before then. My left ear, well, it's this is not really my left ear. Okay, this is fact. I wrote it down, I so I saw it, so I said it, but no, this is just fact. And before I tell you what it is, I'm gonna say thank you, Stacey Abrams. You're a goddess, you're a genius, and you should have been governor of Georgia. Um, here it is. Georgia now has one of the highest voter registration rates in the nation, with 95% of citizens, citizens over 18 years old signed up to vote. And this is according to federal election data released this week. It bodes well for other states. We just need to find a way to replicate Stacey Abrams and put her in every single state. But it does bode well. I mean, that's a resistant state, even though we won two Democratic Senate seats. It's phenomenal. It's so good. It makes my left ear feel that people are gonna come out in droves um, against these draconian voting policies being put in place. And there will be some Supreme Court action. When, when uh, unnamed people go in and start throwing out votes and changing the outcome, it's gonna go to the Supreme Court. Um, now, I had been asked about the lawsuits being hurled at Governor Abbott in Texas, uh, they will stick in a positive way. He's not going to do well with these lawsuits. And in fact, uh, a federal judge just ruled against his mandate that it's temporary, but it's a good sign. Um, and he's being, well, Florida and Texas, their people are uh, pro protesting. They're going, no, no. And Joe Biden has promised to go in and help financially because they're being extorted. They're saying, if you don't play our game, we're gonna withhold funds. Education for children, they're gonna withhold funds, right? That children are our future. It, yes, it's evil. But I wanted to address that question. Um, my left ear. Uh, we just believe DeSantis and Abbott will not be back. They're gonna be voted out. Um, fingers crossed, and my left ear has a pretty strong belief that Beto O'Rourke is gonna run for governor. Texas really needs him. They really need him. He is so fabulous for everybody. You know, not just so fabulous for Democrats or independents. Beto O'Rourke is kind of like uh, Jimmy Stewart <laughs> uh, revisited. So, and my left ear, the Gates indictments soon. Uh, Greenberg, the tax collector in Florida, who's gonna go to jail for a long time, he's really providing tremendous resources of information about Gates and probably other people. I told you, I 
think DeSantis might get folded into some of this sexual stuff. Someone wrote on, on uh, Twitter, this is not coming from me, that they even think Marco Rubio is going to get uh, end up in this Cuisinart of sexual misconduct and trafficking. I have nothing to say about it. I didn't do the runes. It's certainly possible. Um, Michael Cohen, you know, who spent some time in jail and was uh, Trump's attorney, who's done the whole turnaround. He's actually a very smart guy. Got that thick New York thing, but he's really a smart guy. And he, he called uh, DeSantis and Gates, um, or Gates, a narcissistic sociopath. I would say that's pretty accurate. Um, just some stats about Florida, because, you know, a, a, a Twitter friend of mine calls it him uh, Ron the Dictator, and I think that's pretty good. So just a week into the school year, over 10,000 students and staff in the Hillsboro, Hillsboro County Public School System District in Florida have been isolated or quarantined as districts across the state grapple with COVID-19. It is the seventh largest school district in the U.S. with more than 213,000 students. As of Wednesday, 10,384 students and 338 staffers were isolated, put under quarantine, according to ABC News. So <clears throat> in total, there were 1,805 COVID-19 cases, probably more today, um, among students and staff. And in one district, you may have read, three instructors died. So the district is requiring masks for students, but parents can opt their children out of it. And so far, 28,000 parents have opted out of it. So when I tell you that I'm feeling grave today, you know, this, this is part of it. It's just carrying that heavy load. And then regard to Mississippi, over 20,000 students are in quarantine. I'm going to say that again. 20,000 students are in quarantine after the first week. 5,900 tested positive for COVID. And a health official described Mississippi's uh, current state with the virus as a tsunami. And Mississippi has the second lowest vaccination rate in the U.S. What do we do about propaganda and ignorance? I don't have, I don't have an answer for you. I just have the question. Well, now I'm going to go on to lighter because people are really enjoying this, they're telling me, so I'm doing it. Back to kindness on the streets. Um, I read a tweet yesterday, uh, I follow John Flannery, and John Fan Flannery, he's often on MSNBC, he's a former New York federal prosecutor, he's an animal lover, so I really like that, and he's always showing pictures of his dogs and his pigs and his horses. Um, smart, tough guy. He told a little story about he had lost one of his notebooks that he had doodled in and wrote lots of ideas and speeches, and he lost it, and it got mailed to him. It got sent to him. He doesn't know who did it. So he was talking about how wonderful it was. So I wrote him because he reads my tweets. Real gentleman. He reads my tweets, and he responds to me. Um, I said, John, on my YouTube channel, I've just introduced... Um, a feature called Kindness on the Street. And this was an act of kindness. And he wrote me back and he went, that is terrific, Kindness on the Street. So isn't that cool? So that was like good evidence. I just got that shout out from John Flannery. Um, I received Kindness on the Street. So I, I, rather than always telling you how I give it, I'm gonna tell you also how I received it. I was on my way to Burbank uh, to a shoe repair. There's like the best shoe repair on the planet there. The guy can do anything and he serves the studios. So I get there and they're doing all this major street work and there was no place to park. And so I parked on a side street. Now I'm standing on a corner thinking, God, crossing the street and getting to that shoe repair is going to be challenging. Where a hard hat saw me, a man in a hard hat, the yellow and the yellow. And he said, wait a minute. <clears throat> 
and he crossed the street and he got me. He goes, it's dangerous. I'm going to, I'm going to walk you. And so you can get to the, he walked me across the street. I went into the shoe repair, did my business, came out. He saw me again. He walked me back across the street so I could get to my car. It's just a sweetheart. And I will tell you, I'm just going to mention this every time I have this happen more with people with brown skin than white skin. It just, and he had dark brown skin. So really sweet, right? Really sweet. He noticed me and he stepped out. Here's another one I received that was so cool. I was waiting for drinks at Starbucks and there was a woman with white hair and she kept staring, looking at me, looking at me, do I know her? Well, she walked over to me and she said, hi, I just, I've been watching you and I wanna tell you something. Okay. She said, about four or five years ago, I had an accident. And after I recuperated, I became psychic. Well, that interested me, right? And she said, I want you to know that you're going to live a very long time. I was just, what? She goes, yeah, you're going to live a very long time. I don't remember her name, but that's another um, piece of kindness on the street. And you know, when you receive these kindnesses, they turn into good evidence. So the hard hat who walked me across the street, that was good evidence. And the woman telling me, you're gonna live a long time. Good evidence. Um, I wanna say something about good evidence. Cause I'm gonna rewrite the book and make it a, make it a um, paperback. You don't have to think positively. I said that to a friend and she thought it was hilarious. I said, but you don't. And here's the reason. If you notice good evidence taking place, if you create good evidence taking place, um, you don't have to think positively. It does the work for you. It's about noticing any good event you create or contribution to another person or kindness to another person or what you receive, and it automatically lights you up, okay? So you don't have to go think it, you just have to notice. It's a lot easier, isn't it? Write me if you have any questions. So I got one little last piece of really cool evidence that I'm gonna share with you because this week was more about receiving evidence. I have it, you know, I'm out there every day, but some days I'm contributing more than other days. I'm always giving compliments though. Love to give compliments to strangers. Uh, I received a phone call over the weekend and it was a gentleman with a French accent and he didn't think I remembered him, but I totally remembered him. He's the father of a 15 year old boy. And I had gotten a call before COVID from he and his mom, uh, from the husband and wife about their son. I'm not gonna say his name. Um, they were worried about him really good boy, not into drugs or anything, but he had like kind of an eating issue and he would only eat like four things, just really a quirky situation. And he thought it would be interesting to come to hypnotherapy. So they started to bring him and I really liked this young man. He was exceptional in many ways. He was a, a, ahead of himself and he took from me everything that I had to offer, including the esoteric remarks, like you ask a 15 year old, what positive benefit are you getting out of only eating? And I got to convince him he got attention. Well, COVID came and a 15 year old can be very um, opinionated and set in their way. So he said, no, I don't want to zoom. I want to be in the room with Carrie. And of course we couldn't do that. So we parted ways, but we had done about maybe five or six sessions. So this was the father of the boy who called me. Oh my God. I never thought I'd hear from them again. Well, first of all, he wants to tell me that his son, I'm going to call him Ronnie. That's not his name. Ronnie has changed profoundly after you worked with him because he had to go back on quarantine and do high school alone. 
that's changing now. He said his eating habits have opened up. His school grades have been top and he's been exercising and he said, you should see him. And I said, I bet he's all buff and sort of grown up because now he's 16. And he said, oh yeah, and he got an offer from UCLA. This is why I do this work. This is why I do this work. And there actually is something in hypnotherapy called the law of delayed reaction, which means you can work with someone and they may not get the benefit for a month or two later. And I've had that happen. I had a woman, she had been an author and successful and she had writer's block. I started working with her on writer's block and we were at a um, seminar and I would see her at breakfast and she, she was very tough and she'd say, I'm not writing yet. And I go, you will. I'm not writing yet. Well, she wrote and she finished the book. It was the law of delayed reaction. I think there's maybe allergies today because my nose is itching. I'm so sorry, I keep doing that. All right, the quotes. I got juicy quotes today. So settle back and listen. You've probably heard this one before. It's by Benjamin Franklin. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I thought of that this week, but it's true of all of our lives. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Benjamin Franklin, it is a great quote. All right, so this is by famous author Herman Hess. He said, I began to understand that suffering and disappointments and melancholy are there not to vex us or cheapen us or deprive us of our dignity, but to mature and transfigure us. And so, you know, that reminds me of something in neuro-linguistic programming, which I have training in. Uh, they always ask us when something goes awry or there's a painful, you know, breakup, divorce, what, what are your learnings? What did you learn? That you immediately go to what you learned from the event. I'm gonna repeat Herman Hess, I just love it. I began to understand that suffering and disappointments and melancholy, which is me today, a little melancholy, are, not, are there not to vex us or cheapen us or deprive us of our dignity, but to mature and transfigure us. Mm, it's beautiful. And now, this last one is by an author named Laura Hillenbrand, and she wrote the book Sea Biscuit. She writes, she's a very prolific author. And uh, sea, Biscuit, sea Biscuit is one of my favorite stories and one of my favorite movies because, you know, I love a story about the underdog. She wrote, think about the former guy when I read this, okay? The paradox of vengefulness is that it makes men dependent upon those who have harmed them, believing that their release from pain will come only when their tormentors suffer. And many people have said similar things over the years, that uh, something about getting in the mud with pigs, can't remember that one, but that the more we hate, the more we're bound to the person that we hate. <clears throat> So we see it and then we're, then we're managed and controlled by it. I do want to say this is an ideal and uh, I've certainly have felt feelings of hate over the last couple of years and I work at it and I try to neutralize it, et cetera, et cetera. So we're finishing up for today. I think this maybe was my longest one. I hope you're good. Take care. Get an ice cream cone. Go be somebody's good evidence. You don't have to think positively, just notice. And as always, make peace, make memories. Make peace, make memories. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, friends. <laughs>